Uh, I am going to dive in with a question that I am stealing from a really good uh, DGA panel I saw, which is, um, during shooting, where do you like to be, guys? And we'll start with you, Allie, because you're, you're number one in my order here. Ah. Like, where do I... Yeah, are you by the monitor? Are you, are you next to a camera out there? Where do, you, where do you like to be? Where are you most comfortable? Where do you do your work during shooting? Um, I like to be at the monitor, and then if I think of anything, then I go stand near the director. But mostly, I like to be at mostly I like to be at the monitor, and I can also space out there and not <laughs> feel guilty. And do you usually have staff there? Is it, do you usually have like the writer or another writer, or who's who's yeah. with you? Who's with you? Well, usually, actually. It's hard to do all the stuff for the show and be on the set. So there are like set people that that are really in charge of it. And I try to be there when I can, but I don't necessarily get to be there as much as I want to. Okay, very cool. Uh, Megan, how about you? Same question. Um, yeah, I'd like to be behind the monitor. I would say sort of pacing back and forth between being in the scene and being behind the monitor and back and forth. Um, I work with uh, Rob and David that are both uh, on camera talent and I'm the only strict, strictly or just a writer. So I like to bounce back and forth with them. And then as soon as they are set up, I, I get, get out of the way. How much do they run back and forth? Are they watching every take or at some uh, uh, point are they leaving it in your hands? Yeah, they watch the first take or two and and then they like to get into obviously the scene and, and then we get looser and do some improv. So once that starts happening, they like to just kind of be in that moment. So uh, then they leave it to me, <laughs> stand behind and, and the director obviously. Um, but I love being there and I can just shout out uh, alts that I have. Um, and when we get into the groove, that's the best place. Very cool. Uh, Prentice, same to you. Yeah, I think pretty similar to what Megan said. I mean, I'm mostly at the monitor. Usually we'll have, I mean, with our show, we have to write out the whole season for the most part before we start filming, just because trying to break stories while Issa's in like 80% of the scenes would just be impossible. So we pretty much have the season written with the exception of some rewrites. So I'm usually at the monitor with uh, one of our other EPs who's kind of covering that episode. Um, and then usually I'll go up and then sometimes just like throw out and like throw alts around um, closer to camera just because we can just, you know, shout it out kind of quickly to try stuff. But for the most part, at the monitor and then, you know, again, sometimes up there. Oh, I lost you there for half a second. You froze. Oh, <laughs> sorry. No, I was just saying that we're no, 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 no. at the monitor, but sometimes I'm up there uh, shouting out, you know, some alts and stuff. Okay. Um, since you guys all brought it up, um, Improv. I mean, you guys have amazing casts, obviously. You have amazing writing staffs and whatever, but um, the role of improv in your shows, um, you know, you know, where does it fit in? How important is it? Do you guys get to rehearse a little bit or is rehearsal really shooting, you know what I, you know what I mean, as opposed to a, 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 an actual rehearsal? Um, and so how do, where does improv fit in in your world? Prentice, why don't you start since... Uh, yeah. Sure. Yeah. I mean, we do a fair amount of it. I mean, we always obviously get it as it is on the page because, you know, we have a lot of stuff that could, the scene can start comedic and get kind of dramatic. So you don't kind of want to riff too much off of that stuff. But I mean, we have amazing, obviously, Issa and Yvonne Orji and Natasha Rothwell and Amanda Seals who are really great at it. So a lot of times you'll just have like one or two things in the bag and then they'll just kind of come up with a bunch of different things. And usually the alts are like the improv usually what more than likely sometimes usually ends up being in there. But you do try and make sure you get the script as written a couple of always. times before. So you've always got that to fall back on in and out. Absolutely. Edit. Yeah. Cool. Uh, Megan, uh, we'll go to you now. Yeah, um, similar. We, I mean, we try to keep the scripts pretty short. Um, on on Sunny, for instance, we go for 25-page scripts because we oh know that God. there's... Wow. Yeah, because we know there's going to be improv. So it keeps the story very tight. That means that you know within a scene what needs to be accomplished for the story. And then anything that happens around it, you've given yourself some breathing room in the edit for that. Um, we took that model over to Mythic Quest, um, but obviously it's not handheld. So it's been a little tougher adapting that to make sure that we get all the alts that we got on one side, making sure we get them on the other. And that just like takes a little bit more focus. Um, 
but uh, often we, I mean, we definitely get the scene as written, um, make sure we get that on the page and then we throw out alts um, and we just have to rely on our scripty to <laughs> really be writing them down as fast as possible. How many cameras are you shooting with at any given time? Uh, two to three, um, yeah, depending on the scene. Um, you know, as much as possible, we try to get cross coverage because then whatever plays in the natural rhythm, we can just let happen. Um, but sometimes that's not possible. And sometimes we like doing, you know, with, with Mythic Quest, we like giving it a more premium feel. So we're trying to give it a little more cinematic, whereas Sunny, you're just trying to like capture all that crazy action uh, kind of as it happens. Yeah. Uh, so that's been a bit of a change, but we're adapting to it pretty well. And honestly, it's just about getting the cast like comfortable with each other, um, with the scene, um, making sure you don't over rehearse it so that you lose kind of, you know, make sure that you have the cameras running in case something naturally kind of funny happens, but then also um, make sure you're covered for if it's not as funny in the edit as you thought it was on the set. <laughs> the uh, the 25 page script is a fascinating idea, leaving the room. We did the opposite on Veep. We did like a 50 page script <laughs> and then improv on top of it. And the, of course we had these like hour long cuts, uh, which was insane. But anyway, um, Ali, over to you. How about the role of improv is obviously um, so much of that is obviously uh, A.D. Bryant's background, obviously. Yeah, so she's really good at it. And then a lot of the actors that she knew that are on the show, like Joe Firestone, Patty Harrison, and different people. I mean, it mostly depends on, like, who's in the scene and what the scene is. Because some scenes with, like, Joe, there's going to be tons of improv. And then scenes that are more dramatic, there's going to be less. But... Yeah, like Megan said, it's 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 hard to keep track of like the really good stuff to make sure that the editors are like not like we can't use any of that. But also sometimes just the improv takes are the ones we use, even if it's closer to the script, not a huge amount of improv because it sometimes winds up being the most natural version. Right. Um this is sort of connected to what we've been talking about, um, but a, a writer friend of mine once said that if you think about the three phases, the writing, the shooting, and the editing, um, the, the only real way to have a life as sort of a showrunner is to sort of let go of at least one of those sections. So my question is, do you guys have lives? What do you find it's a little easier to maybe let go of? Where do you where do you obsess more, like to try and actually occasionally see your families or such? Do you know what I'm saying? Uh, Megan, you want to go first on this one? Um, yeah, that's definitely the edit for me. I like to be fresh eyes. That's what I call it. It's like, oh, we need somebody to be fresh eyes and come in later once it's been kind of assembled. That's an important uh, person to be. So yeah, I definitely kind of step back uh, there. I, I, I like being in the edit, but it's my, I would say writing is my number one and on set a close second and then editing is a very distant third for me. And who is, is your editor just doing your first cut or are your partner uh, doing it basically? Well, yeah, thankfully we've got sort of a trio of, yeah. of, of the three of us. So um, Rob and David will be covering that. And honestly, sometimes like one person will, uh, uh, because if it's my episode, I'll spend a little time in the edit on one uh, versus another, but we do try to keep one person a little bit fresher so that they're not just seeing endless cuts. Sure. Um, yeah. And do you feel it does give you a little bit of a life? Uh, <laughs> well, I, as much of a life as I care to have. I would fair say. enough. That's uh, very, very I fair answer. Yes. I like we'll working, uh, so I'm, I'm fine with the amount of life it gives me. Okay, okay. Apprentice, how about you? Do you have a life? <laughs> uh, uh, I, had to, I had to force myself to have, when I'm married, I have three children who are very active at school and sports. And so we have, um, thankfully, we have two other EPs. So if shooting gets crazy, then I can sort of say, hey, it's seven o'clock, I'm gonna go see the kids or whatever. You guys are gonna be until 10 or 11. So, so we've sort of instituted that. Um, early on, we did not have that in place. I was there all the time for all three phases. But I, I think for me, you know, obviously, you know, being the showrunner, like the writing, I'm super there. And on the set, I'm, uh, that would be like my second, also because Issa is in so many of the scenes. 
that she does, she doesn't watch her takes. So she really like counts on my eyes being the one to sort of do that. And then as a result, editing is kind of her first time to really kind of see see it as much because even if we're filming other people, she's usually got, you know, she's got to, you know, she's got to do a wardrobe thing. So she's sometimes not even around for the other character stuff as much. Um, she's there as much as she can be, but usually editing is her. So I kind of let, I try to like shape it as much as I can on set as our original intention. And I kind of have let editing kind of be her time to really play with it and make sure she's getting, you know, sort of what she wants. I, like I direct on the show now too. So obviously when it's, I'm, I'm, not, so I'm directing, I'm certainly weighing in more on the cut, but I really try to let editing be her hands on it as much as possible because again, when she's filming, she's not able to do it as much. My phone is ringing. Let me kill that. But I'm going to ask you a question, <laughs> Allie. Same question for you. I'm going to duck out, turn that off. But Allie, same question. Do you have a life? I don't. I don't have a life, but I also leave the writing, shooting, and editing mostly to AD anyway. Okay. So it's weird. That way. Um. <laughs> But I think I'm most involved in the writing and then the shooting, I sort of have a lot of management things to do. And then the editing, it's with it, like 80 looking over everything. And and so I guess, yeah, me and Lindy are involved mostly in the writing part of it. And then, and then the editing and the shooting are mostly when 80 jumps into it. But I do, um, we film in Portland and we were writing in New York. And so I wasn't living at home for any of it. So I didn't really have a life anyway. I don't mean that to sound as sad as it came off. <laughs> it wasn't sad. It came off very sad. It came off sad yes. because of our times, but it is not as sad as <laughs> it was a perfectly fun time. Excellent. Um, uh, I, I'm also peering at everybody's questions, and I know this is definitely a part of this uh, that I think people are very curious about. And I'll kind of pair it together, two questions I was sort of wondering about. One, what was your favorite, um, what was your uh, favorite like TV show as a kid? Like maybe a show that either got you interested or just even your favorite show. And then where I'm leading, where I'm going with that really is, um, who taught you to write? Like where do you feel like you learned to be a TV writer? Um, you know, for myself, I, I can think of different phases of my life. I learned a, a, a crap load at Saturday Night Live from Jim Downey and Al Franken. And then Larry David's the one that really taught me to write sitcoms. So sort of those questions to you guys. Um, Allie, you want to jump in um, to, 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 to cover for your sad, sad answer? Oh, yeah. Last time? <laughs> the first one. Okay, so the first part, I would say the shows are, which don't really match each other, are... Which is totally cool. Uh, Laverne and Shirley and Little House on the Prairie, both <laughs> of which date me as old. And then the people that taught me to write, I think the first show I worked on was Judd Apatow. And then I think he, he definitely was my mentor through even not working with him, you know, getting his advice on writing and all of that. And also the other people the other people who worked on Undeclared when I met Judd, which was like Seth Rogen, Nick Stoller, um, Joel Madison, and just their writing styles like taught taught me my style basically. But it was sort of under the Judd Judd world. Um, to follow up on that, just to dig a little, is there something that you think of in particular that? How how you attack a script, how you attack a story that is particularly Judd, you know what I mean, or one of like or or any of those guys, like 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 a philosophy or anything to it. I mean, like Joel or Seth have a very like easygoing, natural way of just sort of spitting things out, and Judd does too. But I think a lot of it. I mean, the Judd thing that I carry with me is like constant brainstorming and write like the first weeks of the show are ideas 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 and when you think you have no more keep going because that's when the weird stuff comes out and just being very loose about throwing stuff out and rewriting and not being precious and just you know doing things in drafts and that kind of thing and is that how you set your shows up now? Do you try and build in a lot of like a big sort of 
pre-writing just idea time, so to speak? Do you try and do that? I do, but I feel like the management part that I have to do now, like makes me tighten it up a little. So because there's just too much that has to get done, but ideally it would be like that. And even anytime there's like a problem in a scene, you could say to the writer, like come up with a list of 15 ways this could go. And that, you know, like just going through volumes of ideas and looking for what's really good in that. Sure. Prentice, how about you? Uh, favorite show as a kid and then who taught you? Yeah. I used to, I mean, I, obviously I grew up, I grew up in the 80s, so I used to love 80s sitcom when somebody would do something, you'd hear, ooh, those were all the shows <laughs> I loved. So like anything that was like Three's Company and, and uh, you know, like Facts of Life and, and, and different strokes were all like shows that were like my uh, things growing up that, uh, that so I love I love those shows. Um, in terms of like the style, I think like I, sh I started on Girlfriends from Mark Rock and Keel. And I would say that's like where I really, obviously I knew nothing. I mean, I was writing, but in terms of like really learning under somebody, I knew nothing. And I learned so much from under Mar, I think so much of my style today, which is like, you know, always trying to find the, you know, playing with tone a lot. You know, we would do scenes that would be really comedic and then kind of veer into the dramatic. Um, and it's some of the things that we adopt on Insecure that I think just kind of I liked about my I liked about writing, which is like kind of a scene going one way and then kind of upending the audience and going a different direction by the end. Um, so so th that's the stuff that I really like love to do um, and sort of play with that. And that was one of the thing, biggest things I learned from Mara, which was always um, I remember she would say, uh, "You can always uh, find a new joke. You can't always find a new moment." And she would always be about trying to find what's the most um, um, honest emotional moment in this scene. You know, what are we getting at? She'd always harp, harp like, what is the story about? And I think that's something that still sticks with me today. I just always try to go, at the end of the day, what is this about? At the end of the day, if you distill it down to its most, you know, at its lowest common like denominator, what is it about? And I think that's one of the things that I think still sticks with me that I just carry on in everything I do. Very cool. Uh, Megan, how about you? Um, yeah, well, as a kid, I also grew up in the 80s, so I watched, I remember Daria being a huge thing for me um, when that hit. I remember that being the first character where I thought, oh, that seems like me. Somebody wrote my, myself onto television, so that was really big. My mom also banned MTV in our house, so like I had to go to the YMCA to watch it on the televisions in the exercise rooms, um, which made it, it seem like very really, forbidden fruit. Yes. Oh, it, if you ever want your kid to get really into something, just tell them not to do it, and then that is like the way forward. Um, my, I also used to watch Letterman with my dad. Um, I, the first thing, comedy thing I can ever remember writing were top 10 lists when I was younger because I thought that was like, um, I, I probably just saw him laugh at one of those and I was like, all right, that's what I want to do forever. Um, as far as what taught me uh, to be a writer, I would say The Onion really, I mean, that was my first job, um, real job in comedy and uh, that taught me uh, how to throw away jokes, which was a great lesson to get early. We used to write 25 um, headlines every Monday, and you'd be lucky to get four of them to go past that first meeting. And it just taught me how to, not only the, um, the simplicity, uh, which we were just talking about, but the, but just like, just, just keep going, you know, just keep thinking there's always a new joke. You can come up with another one. Um, and uh, that was really good once I got to Community, my first show, which is where I learned how to write a sitcom episode. Um, and we threw out jokes all the time because there really was such a focus on story. Um, I, I totally agree with that, that like you can't find uh, multiple moments um, and you can always figure out a different joke. So that, that really taught me the focus on story. Then I carried that through into um, and, and learned on Sunny how to write these short scripts, which is just like it's always honing it down to like the bare minimum and knowing that it will be funny when you get it, but it can't always be interesting and it can't always like pull people in. You don't get that story first. So, uh, but it all started with the onion of just like 
figuring out how to kill your darlings. I think that was a good lesson. It, it, learning not to be precious. I mean, especially with, you know, young writers, I think it's a, that's a great lesson. To, I mean, all, all these are great lessons, but the fact that, yeah, people are going to say no, or we don't like it, or that there is a funnier joke, or you need to find a funnier joke. But uh, yeah, that's great. I was going to throw in something I learned way back, and I was shocked at the time, was when I first got to Seinfeld, um, I remember sitting in the edit room and the way they would sometimes get down to uh, you know length was they were cutting really good jokes. And it was just like, I don't understand, what are you doing? You're cutting really good jokes. And it was like, you gotta cut these jokes if the story works. And there are episodes of Seinfeld to this day where there are killer jokes, but the story doesn't work and they're not good episodes. And it's, it's so it's sort of what you guys are all talking about, which I think is really interesting. Um, uh, I know a lot of people are interested in this, so let's talk a little bit about um, the writer's room and staff and how you find writers and sort of kind of move into that section, because uh, I, I can tell people are very interested in that. Um, we'll start, uh, let me just start very broadly with the writer's room and how you use it. Um, I myself, I love a writer's room for just chatting about ideas and I love a writer's room for punching something up, that sort of old style sitcom of writing it in the room and then it's your turn to write or your turn to write or your turn to write is literally to me the worst thing I've ever seen and experienced in my life um, and hate that idea of it. So, but if you, if that's how you work, convince me otherwise, how, what, what is the room to you? How do you use it? How big is your staff? Tell me, tell me, tell me these things. Allie, how about you? We'll start. Yeah, I agree with you. I, I remember the first time I saw someone like put a script on a monitor and being like, a monitor is to watch TV. It's not to like look at a static page. Like I can't, I can't live like this. <laughs> have like no attention span for that. So I, I agree with the way you do stuff. It's just coming up with, I, having people come up with ideas and talking, you know, a lot of it is like, which I realized through other rooms I've been in with other showrunners, like the chit, you know, the talking about your life or the world and all of that, like sometimes people will shut that down and be like, okay, let's get into it. But I feel like that stuff is like really important. Like you might get to the funniest or most you know, intense thing just in, in that kind of conversation and not, you know, not being like, especially a comedy room, like just keeping it light whatever way you can, you know, like those, as much as I hate to say it, like the YouTube videos and those times can turn into really good stuff. Yeah. Actually. <laughs> but the room is about, it's, it, this, it's usually I like it uh, maybe around seven people on the on the smaller side and yeah just getting everyone to you know talk and focus and and just getting a bunch of different ideas out there and being positive to people without necessarily using every single thing anybody says but you know making people feel like open to saying whatever they want. Sure. Any room pet peeves? Like, like what does a writer do that would drive you crazy in a room or has driven you crazy in a room? Uh, when they ask why we are we doing it this way and I explain it and then they keep talking about how if it was up to them, they would never do it that way. <laughs> you can the small amount of energy I have and that I can always put on this. And also just the phone, the looking at the phone drives me crazy, but I don't, I mean, yeah, I usually say leave your phones out of the room, but then it gets sort of hypocritical because I always have my phone in the room. <laughs> okay, <laughs> that's great. Apprentice, how about you, the room? Where does the room fit into your world? Yeah, I mean, obviously our show is about people dating and having relationships, and so, you know, I love it when we get to talk about, you know, people's real life stories. I mean, so much of that has made its way into our show. Like people, you know, just sharing their lives or their friends' lives or, hey, I went on this date this weekend. And so all those things are, are really, um, uh, you know, obviously exciting to have. I mean, we sort of, uh, 
we room write. Uh, obviously, like we talk about stories and we sort of break the stories together. But because we're always under such a time crunch, and, and I didn't, I grew up, I, I, where I, just, I came up where you, you know, like a writer gets an episode, they go off the write, they come back and we do that. But I learned on another show that in terms of room writing stuff, we would sort of Frankenstein script. So you would like take three scenes and go off and kind of, you know, write those scenes sure. and kind of come back because we would need a script fast. And because we were doing like 26 episodes, and then you'd sort of just kind of keep massaging it until it was sort of right. And we got under a time crunch on Insecure the first season, and I had just learned that. And I was like, hey, why don't we try this thing? And then that actually ended up being kind of what ended up working for us. So we sort of have a, we, we sort of have a writer who has a take on the episode as sort of like that's their name. And so when they're on set, they might have a more affinity or better understanding of like why this is going to work. Um, At but, some point know, in that process, does that writer ever take the whole thing over here and, for lack of a better word, no, not really. No, not no. no not okay. really. I mean, for the most part, it's usually like we have to kind of get these things out kind of quickly and kind of get ideas expressed very quickly because, again, we're under such a crunch to have them all written ahead of time. So usually, even if we Frankenstein it, we can have a draft done in a day, and that just saves obviously so much time. And we, I mean, like, like we're still massaging it, and obviously, like the other, but then again, to the fresh eyes of it, we'll sort of then do a table read and for the whole staff. So then the staff has, that was away from it for a second kind of comes back with like, I didn't catch this thing or this thing's kind of off or I have a joke for this. And you kind of get, again, fresh eyes on it as well from the other room too. So that sort of is our process. In that kind of, forgive me, group right world, I don't know what to call it, Frankenstein yeah. world, do you find that you or maybe Issa or somebody else is sort of the, what's the word I'm looking for, the, 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 the police person of the voice. Do you know what I'm saying? Absolutely. So she, so essentially after we sort of get it to a, cause we'll write it together, we'll massage it to a place where we feel like, okay, it's good to read for the room. The room will give notes or either I'll weigh in on Issa's and, and Issa will run a room and I'll run the other room. And then once we sort of get you those notes, we'll go back in again. We'll keep rewriting it as a, as our separate rooms. But then once it's done, Issa and I will sit together and go through it together once we feel like, okay, it's at its best point we could be. Now let's put our eyes on it. So it kind of has that stamp essentially of being done. So yeah, it does kind of go through like a final pass between she and I together. Very cool. Megan, how about you? Um, yeah, we uh, have the pleasure of doing, um, you know, 10 episodes or so and not having production happening simultaneously. So I've definitely been on staffs. Um, where you do need 12, 13 people. I just don't think that that's sane for 10 episodes. Um, so we try to keep it small. We, we, we shrank the staff between the first and second season. Um, and uh, part of that was that we just realized that there's only so much, um, so many options you need thrown at you at any one given moment. And uh, so we like to, to go to the room when we need options, when we're breaking like big arcs of the season or we're trying to think of blue sky episodes and things like that. Um, and then some days we, we won't bring the room in and Rob and David and I will just meet together and we will discuss like, okay, now that we have these big ideas, how might we shape the season and we can have like kind of a more focused conversation about that and, and make some calls and then return to the room and say, hey, now we've had these things. And, and hopefully that's so funny what um, Ali said about <laughs> people being like, but why? It's like, because this is the way. But, <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but we, we kind of try to do that. And that way, you know, you're not wasting anybody's time. Um, you, you're really, when you go to them, you know what you want. You're not just asking the room for something. You know what you're looking for. So we really try to do that. Um, we do, we try to avoid Frankensteining drafts, but that sometimes does happen later on in the episodes as we get closer to production. Usually that happens on like our episodes that Rob and David and I take and we just like group write them ourselves kind of in like split up scenes. Um, I don't particularly like that because it usually <laughs> involves Rob calling me like, are you done? Are you done? Are you done? Are you done with your scene? Because he writes very fast. And I, I miss the time when you took it home and did like a week. Um, that's my ideal where you get like five days and you get to sit with it and you get to make all, move all your commas around and whatever you want. Um, but we try, I try to be like flexible with that, uh, whatever produces the best thing. Um, but ultimately, yeah, it does get into a smaller space. I think it's 
more humane in a way to to leave the writers room out of it at a certain point because i've i've sat in rooms where the showrunner has selected like basically an entire script and hit delete in front of that writer and the whole writing staff and oh, wow. that can be like <laughs> yeah and it can be very brutal and so i think as a as a showrunner sometimes you need to have those discussions make your decisions and then come back and present that to the room um Connected to the room, obviously, it's the rooms are really about, and you know, obviously, other than that room where the one guy deleted the entire script, um, hopefully, obviously, you build a room where you trust your writers, you know your writers, or, you know, you're finding these writers. Like, what are you guys looking for? Again, I think people will be very interested in this. What are you looking for in a writer? How are you, are you thinking about the room, the dynamics? Like, what pressures are you worrying about? You know, what, what are you looking for? Maybe just simply, are you reading specs? Are you like, how are you, how are you finding people? There's no right or wrong answer, obviously, but just sort of what, what has worked? What are your guidelines? Whatever, Prentice, you want to jump in on this? Yeah, I mean, obviously, you know, before the, all the writer stuff with the agents, I mean, you'd get scripts in a very traditional way or a friend that says, hey, you know, I got, I know you guys are looking for writers, blah, blah, blah. And obviously as you're reading writers ahead of time, you're, you, you know, at least for us, because at least one of the things that I experienced, obviously as a writer of color, is I've been on shows that were primarily African-American and I've been on shows that are sort of mainstream shows that are, are mostly white showrunners. And usually on those shows that I'm very thankful for those jobs, but I was the only person of color. And I would see like, and it's no knock, it would, I would see like, you know, seven guys that went to Harvard and then like one of me and I would go, we can't hire like a decent Indian guy or something like to take one of the Harvard guys out. And uh, and so I, I would, my thing was always like not wanting to repeat voices in the room. Right. So but my thing is always like, you know, obviously we're all comedy writers and we but I think even in our comedy. Right. Like we would try to find at least the way we've assembled our room is to say like, oh, we have somebody who kind of is like has a darker style of their like to their comedy or this person really creates just like interesting moments that are just kind of like because it's all, I think it's all about the type of show you're trying to make, right? And so our show, I mean, we have drama writers on our show because obviously our shows have things that are dramatic. And so we try to at least make the voices in our show not feel like, oh, we have five of, because I think the trope would be we would need like a bunch of people who are like Issa. And the truth is, is like, you don't need anybody like Issa when you have that, right? So we actually try to find other styles or other voices in the comedy. So it's like, oh, we just don't have five people that all are kind of the same, like five just guys who just give you a bunch of jokes. And those things are good, but I think we try to like space out, like what does our show need to succeed in the style it is? And let's kind of find people that sort of, you know, there are people who are on our show who do just do great jokes. There are people who do big concept ideas, right? Who are like really great at conceptual things, right? And so it's not pretend that they are funny, but they just offer something also very specific. And I think we, at least on this show, we try to make sure each writer has a has their own kind of thing that they're special at as opposed to five people who just do this or four people who occupy kind of the same space. Um, do you find that those differences are showing themselves in, for lack of a better word, spec material or submitted material? Like I'm yes. looking for a dark writer, I'm reading something, oh, this is dark? Or do you find sometimes it emerges once they're on the show or maybe a little bit of both, you know what I mean? Like, yeah, how, I, think how, little, yeah. I, think, I think they initially, at least the way we've hired people, we've been very blessed to have a lot of the same staff from season one, but I think they initially have something that we go, this is voice is very unique in this kind of way. So I think that at least in the writing in, in the beginning, there's at least something that has shown itself that like, oh, this is a very interesting um, style or this is a very interesting you know, point of view um, and obviously that gets honed more on the show, but I think initially there was always something about each of our writers that felt very unique and special that we felt would be a good fit for our show that, oh, we don't have this in our show. We kind of need this energy. Cool. Um, Allie, how about you, your staff, or what you're looking for, or any of those things? Yeah, I mean, because <laughs> I've because I've been doing this for a while on different shows, it's like, I know I know how to put together a story so I don't necessarily need to hire writers that are gonna like know how to break a story, but people who have like totally unique points of views. And yeah, I mean, a lot of that is getting people, they don't necessarily have to be younger, but new, newer to TV writing that have just stories and things in their lives that you've you know never heard before and that contribute a huge amount. There's one writer on Shrill that 
she can make anything erotic. It's amazing. Like any, any, <laughs> like I once like asked her in a scene, I was like, it seems like we need this person to be doing, doing something just so we can, you know, have the scene be more active. I just said in an email, like, can you think of something that is like active for her to be doing in her house? And she's like, what if she's like practicing making knots and ropes for bondage? Like she's just trying out like how to do it. And I was like, I meant like do the dishes or something. It's amazing the way your mind works. And anyway, so a, a, a unique point of view is like what I'm looking for. And I feel like when you read people's specs or see their stand up or or just talk to them, you're like, I know how you'll be fit into this room in a totally different way than anyone else. Do you worry at all? Like, and I don't know, this is not picking on a stand up, but like say a stand up who perhaps doesn't necessarily, hasn't really written scripts, has a point of view, but, or you're prepared to deal with that fact and sort of maybe teach them how to write the script or convert it, yeah. or you'll take it and you'll do it, but you'll, you're getting that viewpoint. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah, combinations of that. But, but if they have not much experience writing TV scripts, the willingness to want to learn how to do it is kind of everything because then, then they can, you know, you can train someone to then be able to do it all on their own at some point. Very cool. Megan, how about you on staff? And I know you said you went for a slightly smaller staff, but and I understand the thinking on that. What are you still looking for, though, in the people and how you're finding them and whatnot? Yeah, well, for Mythic Quest specifically, we wanted the staff to be half um, people that were serious gamers and half people that maybe didn't really play video games that much, just to make you, sure that all the storylines would. Where do you fit in that world? Are you a de gamer? Definitely or not? on the on the side of not. Not I a mean, gamer. I I I not a huge gamer. I I like games, but I'm definitely more of the like puzzle board game. Um, escape room sort of person i'm not really a, a video i when i was younger i used to play video games more often and now i've fallen back into it because of research um but uh but my husband for instance is a big gamer and he is a writer on our show now um and uh for two reasons one um that he's also an actor and on mythic quest is also on sunny like they they've really found success in um actor writers and having people, you know, in the writer's room developing characters for themselves to then play. Um, so uh, he was on staff as one of our writers and then now is also has a small part in the show. Um, and we actually, some of the actresses that were in first season were in the writer's room for the second season, um, learning how to write and like us kind of developing for their voices because we chose people for casting that had this specific point of view and uh, some of them have shown a lot of talent like in the writer's room and pitching stories and things. Um, but yeah, that one's a specific, uh, we, we obviously wanted gamers. So we went after that in an interesting way. Actually, Rob and I separately um, through looking for people found this woman, Ashley Birch, who is a writer, but also an actress who does a lot of uh, voiceover for video games. And she also made a web we found that was like a funny web series about her and her with her and her brother playing um, video games and so we were like oh we'll be, we should hire her and now she is uh, was eventually then cast in the show as one of the characters so um yeah from all different like angles as really oh. you froze there a second or at least on mine sorry I'm so sorry. No, no. no I, uh, is Am I back? Yeah. Back. I don't know if it was just me or you or anyway, we're good. Yes. Um, okay. Quick follow up to all of you guys on, okay. on, on writers in general. Oh, did you have more? I'm sorry. I wasn't trying to interrupt. Did you have more you were going to say there? Uh, I didn't want to, I didn't mean to interrupt. Maybe, oh, sorry. Yeah. yeah, no, no worries. I'll throw another question out to the group and hopefully we'll get you back. Um, in the world of these shorter shows and shorter length shows, which obviously are far more 
pleasurable than say the 22 episode grind. How do you guys hold on to a writing staff? Prentice, you mentioned you've had a lot of writers all through all your seasons. There's a, is it, is it just purely loyal? I mean, that's, that's amazing. You know what I mean? That you haven't been, uh, anyway, please. Yeah, no, I mean, uh, uh, for the first three, I mean, we did, I mean, we had the same, we had the same exact staff for the first three seasons. And then obviously people deals are up and people get other opportunities like the show is successful and people want to develop and, and as they should, you know. And so I, from three to four, this past year was we hired the most. We hired four new people just because we lost so many people to, you know, show running other shows or developing and things like that. So that was, um, you know, obviously a, a big part. But obviously, like, too, a lot of our writing is kind of done. Like, not all the writers stay through the whole run anyway. So usually, like, the first three seasons, we kind of would do, you know, like six months of, you know, you know, four or five months of writing, you know, from, from April, let's say April to, like, you know, August. And then they're free to kind of go do other stuff. So, like, so some would go do other shows in between, you know, kind of do another shorter, because nobody's really doing 20, you know, four episodes anymore, unless you're doing network anyway. So a lot of times they would go do, I'm going to go do six episodes over here, and I'll do eight on your show, or I'll do eight here. So so we were uh, very blessed that we were always like, you know, people were kind of, you know, could go do other stuff in between um, seasons too. Very cool. Um, Ali, how about you guys? Again, you're now, uh, you're about to start your third season. How are you on ret retaining writers, I guess, basically? Well, this the first to the second, um, I think we lost people and we also just reconfigured it a little based on the first season and then what we needed for the second season. Sure. This time we're just keeping, we're keeping all the same people. We're lucky enough to get them back and uh, we were going to hire some new people, but I'm a little wary to do that with this format with Zoom because it's, uh, uh, it's hard to integrate a new person who doesn't just like know the shorthand in this way. So we'll start out the season with everybody we had and then see, see maybe hire a couple other people as time goes on. And you said the other day you're about to start up the season three room, correct? Yeah, in, in two weeks. And you're going to start, you're going to be Zooming, obviously. Are you guys, um, Megan or Prentice, have you guys been zooming a room yet or where are you or anybody doing that yet we haven't yet no is that the um, plan or are you still figuring the plan out or do you know when you're i know you're still you just started airing the new season but do you have a date for writers yet or not quite yet not quite yet but we're but we're obviously having preliminary conversations about sure. how that would be and i'm sure it'll be some version of this format yeah uh and megan um, sorry yeah we were in, so we were in production. We did one week of production on our second oh, wow. season and then shut down. Uh, so we uh, used uh, Zoom to finish the scripts. Um, uh, just Rob and David and I um, using it a little bit. And then we, we have been in talks, though, of starting a, a writer's room because we don't really want to just keep looking at the scripts for season two. It feels like we'll just overwork them. Sure. So we've talked about maybe getting a, a small room together for season three, start talking about ideas. You might as well. Um, that, I mean, that's obviously very smart and obviously the, the overworking. Um, I'll ask one more question, then I'll take some of, uh, there's some really good questions that people have been uh, throwing at me, so I'll do that. Uh, and, uh, but uh, uh, just another question about sort of process, and you're talking about maybe jumping to season three, and I'll start with you, Megan. Um, on Veep, to be very specific, I always liked coming into the season knowing what the opening scene of the first show was, and in some ways, what that first show was, and very much knowing what the final moment of the final episode of that season would be, which in turn threw me into the, the first scene of the season after that, if that makes any sense. So it kind of was this continuous yeah. process, but very much if you, if, when I walked into the room, I could put one up on one end of the whiteboard and one at the bottom all the way on the other side of the room of the whiteboard. And then the goal was figure out how to fill it all in. How do we get there? And obviously things, things changed, but those two endpoints always did stay the same. How do you plan a season? Do you like, are, are you that didactic? Do you like, 
Do you figure it out as you go? What do you, how, how do you, how do you put a season together on an arc? Um, I, I mean, that's, that's better than I, than I do going in. I, I know that. The first, only thing I, I do is very organized. Moment. Everything else is unorganized, I swear. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, again, it, it always depends on the show. So Mythic Quest, we tell a serialized story. Um, Sunny, uh, it, we come in with more like topics. Like we come in like, you know, a couple of years ago, it was like, well, we have to address Me Too. We have to do something about Me Too some way. Um, but Mythic Quest, we do, uh, be, based on the way we end, we ended this second season that we've written, we do know what the first scene would be in season three and what season three would be about, but we haven't figured out the ending. So that's, now you've, like, now I'm scared. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. Um, Prentice, how about you? What, like, as, when you go into each season, sort of the arc or the, you know, the overall, what do you want to do with the season? How do you... Yeah, that's impressive that you have that much. I mean, for the most part, I think Issa and I try to figure out, like, what do we want the theme of the season to be oh, in, a, in a big way? Like, like this year, the, the big topic for us was like, you know, based on where they've come from is like the topic was, uh, um, are these relationships for a reason or a season? And so then we would then we would want it to answer that. So we would kind of give like a, a, a theorem a little bit and go, great, let's either prove this or answer this, or how would we answer this? One year it was like adulting and things like that. And and then but this year weirdly was the first season we came into where we actually knew what the first like to your point, we actually knew what the first scene was gonna be based on Issa saying she doesn't really mess with her best friend anymore. And we just thought, well, where would that take us? Right. And so that became like really exciting. We didn't have the ending planned out yet, but we knew the start, um, like beyond the theme. So usually though, it's a kind of a theme with some sort of loose ideas, um, but that's probably as, as most as we start the season with. Okay. And Allie, how about you? You're getting very close to your season three, as you said, two weeks. What are you, what are you going in with? What do you know? Well, we've talked about some things, but um, not, I feel like we'll talk about me and Lindy and AD will talk about more in the next two weeks before going in. And the first season we had Lindy's book that it was almost all based on, like the spine of the whole season was based on her book. So we had that as a map. And the second season, yeah, we came in knowing ki kind of like what you said, the beginning and the end, and then a few things in the middle. And, and but this this time, we know like she's going to be dating a lot, but not really a ton more than that. Okay. In a perfect world, are you hoping in the next two weeks to figure out a little more or that's okay if that's all you go into the season with? No, we, we should know a little more, especially because of this format with Zoom. I feel like as organized as I try to be um, running the show, this format makes it to have to be even more organized so we should sure. come, come in with with a, a little um some kind of map so that people know what they should really be thinking about very cool um i am gonna take a couple of the questions that uh that people have been uh throwing at me um first one i'm actually very curious about um do you guys look at social media like about your shows in general the night an episode airs do you look at all do you blind yourself to it where does where does that fit in does it ever actually lead to anything or is it just maddening you know so the full gamut and i would think and, and megan i'll start with you i would think with the video game thing in a weird way you must have some very particular critics just like <laughs> the gamer people like that that in, a, in its unto itself would be a, a whole other part of social media in some ways but anyway please go ahead yeah yeah you know um i do i do read stuff i probably shouldn't but it's a bad habit i picked up a community because we were very engaged with our fan base back then um i remember like the first season that i was on community one of the, I was trying to tell one of the NBC executives that we were really big on Twitter and they were like, who gives, who cares about Twitter? <laughs> like that's, and I remember like being like, oh, I guess social media doesn't matter. matter. Now it does obviously. And people really care about it and they want you to live tweet your show and all that stuff. I, I like reading it because I like seeing people engage. 
And I, I know that that means that sometimes I'm going to see stuff I don't want to see. And I've just taken it. I try to take that with a grain of salt. In fact, when our, when the first season of Mythic Quest came out, we had a lot of fun in finding the weirdest tweets that we could find of someone being like, well, I'm 15 minutes into the pilot. And I have to say that I don't like this show. And we're like, you couldn't even wait till the end of the episode to come online and like, tell us what you think. So anyway, uh, but I, you know, it's, it's a good and bad thing. I, the gamer community has been so positive. I can't even tell you. I was a little bit worried about it, not only because I'm not a gamer, but also as a woman, like sometimes all you hear about video is how toxic they are but actually it's just a community full of people that genuinely really love video games and we have made a product that we try to make with a love for video games as well so um they've reacted really really well to it um so i'm not going to stop and, until it gets like psychologically damaging i guess fair enough um before we go into the next question like, just a follow-up question for me which is you know you're talking about some of that video game t male toxicity City that we, you know, I've certainly read about and whatnot, and yet, um, obviously, when you on your guys' show, the head programmer, the two testers, the new assistant—I mean, very female-forward, you know, cast and also in the jobs that they have, um, a conscious decision because of the toxicity, the best people, or kind of a combination thereof. You know what I'm, you know what I'm kind of uh asking? kind of a combination uh, thereof. I mean, obviously we wanted a show that was very balanced. Uh, the cast and had a lot of different voices and different people, but we also wanted to represent the, um, the gaming industry accurately. So we have one female character that is the lead programmer and her character is that we spend a lot of time talking about what a rarity she is to be in that position. And then the other women that we have in the central cast are um, two of the lowest level uh, right. game, video game testers, an, an assistant, and uh, an HR woman. So that's pretty standard for what you're going to find in these offices. And most of our background actors are men, because that's also <laughs> what you're going to find. Um, so, but we try to not make it forced, but also make sure, because obviously we found a lot of really funny women. Actually, for instance, Jesse Ennis, who plays uh, the assistant Joe, on the show, she there was no part for her when she came into audition. We just thought she was so unbelievably funny that we wrote a part for her and stuck it into the show. Um, and so that that's it's been a lot of just finding people and then not being able to not cast them. <laughs> that's excellent, um, Prentice. How about you? Social media, where does that fit into uh, the in your world, the insecure world? Yeah, I mean, um, was, other than ruining secret taco places uh, other than that <laughs> what else <laughs> yeah i mean our show is a big i mean live i mean our show is a big twitter storm of people um you know sunday night in and we just aired this sunday night at the premiere and, and people were you know obviously super excited because we'd been off the air for a while but no social media has been a, a big uh thing and you know I mean they want to again like to live tweet and do all those things and sometimes I, I look and you know sometimes I don't I, I tell myself I'm not gonna look it doesn't really matter as much and then you look and then you get mad like why are you like you don't even know like episode five I'm gonna answer this question like why, why do I gotta do it in the first episode you know and so I've just learned to say like let people I've learned to like be like okay after 10 weeks or eight weeks then I'll if things feel unanswered then cool but um yeah but it's a, it's a big thing on Twitter for sure um, does the critic when there is criticism, does it eat at you at all? Or are you pretty, you're no, okay? Not really. Yeah. I've just learned now at this point, like people are going to like, you're never going to, I mean, you know, you're never going to end the show the right way. You're never going to do this thing the right way. You just have to say like, that's what made sense to us. And so that's why we did it. Okay. Um, Ali, how about you, uh, world of social media? Um, I like looking at Twitter cause it's like very nice and positive, except sometimes a lot of times People like write lines they like in it, and um, and I'm always looking for in like the vain kind of way, like my own jokes as the ones people liked. And almost <laughs> always, it's never my own jokes. It's always the writing staff's jokes. I was like, really? It's like that wasn't funny to you? But um, I also like looking at the Twitter because at Twitter when it starts coming out in different countries. So then it's like suddenly somebody's comments are like, why are her costumes so posh? 
And I'm like, oh, England is watching it. England, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it's obviously I know Twitter is a can be a horrible dark place, but the people that comment on the show, it's almost entirely nice, actually. Very cool. Um, it can be on this show or any show you've ever worked on, worst network note you've ever gotten or any kind of note that you've ever gotten. Allie, you wanna start if you got one? I don't know. I mean, I just remember being in a meeting. This is, this is not being on a show. It's more like pitching shows where someone was like, we just are looking for someone to come up with like a new genre. Like well, yeah. how did that go? Did you come right. up with a new genre? Did you did you get one? Yeah. <laughs> no, no, I didn't. I didn't. Uh, Megan, how about you? Worst note ever. Uh, I I developed a, a pilot a, a while ago that was about two women in sort of a post-apocalyptic like Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid kind of feel. And I got the note a bunch of like, why are they friends? Like, why are they together? And I was like, it's the apocalypse. Like they're <laughs> like, I just always felt like really women have to justify being friends with other women, even at the, after the end of the world. Like that was a very frustrating note to keep getting. And this, how about you? <laughs> yeah, I'm always amazed at the network's notes about how people have to be good at their jobs and how consistent that remains a note. I don't get it at all. I'm like, most people are, a lot of people are bad at their jobs. Why does that, does that make sense? I, I don't, I just, to this day, I still do not understand that note. Uh, but, you know, you get them. And I, so I never understand it. The only time it actually made sense to me was when I was on Brooklyn Nine-Nine. And you're like, yeah, the cops should be good at their jobs. But outside of, like, police officers, I don't understand a comedy where people have to be good at their jobs. But even with that, some of them are bad. Yeah, Otherwise, even with that, some of them are bad yeah. at their jobs. Yeah. <laughs> like, there are cops that are bad at their jobs. So, so I, I still don't understand why, that's, why that matters, but it, it's still funny. I know. Um, I, I remember I just realized after all of these years of working in rooms that people put in, like, dumb people so that you can explain the story to them. <laughs> yeah. oh, that's why. That's why. Why did it take me so long to figure that out? On, uh, in the early seasons of Veep, when I got into the edit room, I found I could cut out a lot of these like extra lines where I was explaining things that had happened or, you know, just anything where it was like, no, no, we know that from the previous scene. They don't have to re-sum it up and cut it out and cut it out. And as we kept going, that then moved into the writing where in the drafts we would be like, no, we don't need that line. And then of course I had less things to cut when I was long in the edit room. It was very <laughs> frustrating, but those kind of like, let me just explain to the audience. Oh, wait, now I don't do that anymore. I need to figure that out. But anyway, um, uh, I, I think we have two minutes left. Um, I don't know if these are weird speed questions. I'm looking to see if there's anything that's like kind of fast, whatever. I know people want to know this actually. So I'm going to ask you, have you guys used the Writers Guild script thing? Have you found anyone through that? Or are you, are you guys looking at that for like at all possible like staffing and whatnot? And uh, I, there's no bad answer here, but just curious if people are. We, we definitely looked through it for ours. We definitely looked through it. We didn't, uh, I don't think we ended up hiring every, anyone through it, but again, we shrank our, our sure. staff, but we definitely read a bunch of scripts. Very cool. Anyone else? Yeah, um, we it didn't come up when we were doing it. It hadn't existed yet, so no. Uh, we have a writer named Amy Aniobi who's super um, uh, involved in the guild, and she'll she'll always say, "Hey, I read this thing, or I read this person." So she's kind of our our unofficial liaison. Oh, that's right. She's kind of funneling people. That's yeah. fantastic. Um, uh, another question, and uh, somewhat fast, maybe. Do you guys, when you're writing or you're in your room, are you ever worrying about the budget? Do you know what I mean? I, you know, it's sort of that part of the showrunner job that none of us want to think about, but are you ever actually thinking about it as you're writing or where does that, when does the budget come into your mind? Is it after the fact? You know what I'm saying? Prentice, you want to jump in there? Yeah, I never think about it really unless, I mean, we had a one episode season three where it was supposed to be Coachella. And so we knew that was going to be a big, 
you know, ask outside of our normal, you know, like our per episode thing. Sure. So that was so, we try to have like big, big uh, conversations ahead of time with, the, with like the network and say, hey, we're thinking about like, like this season, there, there, there's a big thing coming up. So we kind of give like a heads up of like the big ticket items. But by four seasons in, we kind of know what we can kind of pull off and kind of what we can't in some way. And, you know, you borrow from this episode to cover that episode. It's, it's mostly when my live producer goes, you know, we're $90,000 over in this episode. We got, it's mostly at that point, like it's day five. And he's like, we got to, we got to, we got to figure this out. And I go, oh, okay, I didn't know. Um, <laughs> but that's usually when it happens. Very cool. Uh, Megan, how about you? Budget ever uh, entered? Yeah. Your I don't think about it a lot. I mean, I sort of leave that to Rob. He seems to like that. Um, I, I think for a workplace comedy, we just more think about making sure we have a, a few episodes that are all on our own sets and a few where we go outside the office, but not so much that we don't remember that our bread and butter is in the, on the sets. Um, so we try to balance it more creatively. Um, but yeah, obviously very similar. Last season, we had one standalone episode that we made like it was almost a mini movie and so we knew we were going to be blowing up the budget for that so we tried to make other things like on our sets to account for that gotcha um Allie, how about you and then i'll and then i'll I have one final question just to anyone who's paying attention yeah we're wrapping up i swear i did i feel like this is something i learned from working for mike Schur on parks and rec try not to be worried about anything in the writer's room or at least not to seem like I am, you know? <laughs> so I don't also don't think about the budget stuff until much later in, much later in the process than the writer's room. Cool. Um, and this will wrap everything up. Um, and thank you everyone. Um, uh, again, I think, a, I think our audience kind of would like to know, um, if you're reading material, do you prefer a spec script of a show, whether it's yours or another show? Or do you like to read a piece of something, something original? Original. Uh, I, I don't care. Don't care. Okay. I think original. Yeah, I mean, I'm, oh, go ahead. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I've been, uh, it's so funny. I haven't read a spec script in so long. I, I was like, I haven't even seen, I'd love to actually read one now. It probably would stand out more. <laughs> Yeah, people don't write them anymore, but I guess like I got my first job still based on a spec script. So like I have a certain what was your spec? for them. It was, uh, it's always sunny. Oh, really? Wow. Yeah, I, I wrote just a, to, a, just, a <laughs> oh, I said, just to date myself, I think I wrote a spec Murphy Brown in oh. uh, 1990, <laughs> 1992. Yeah. I, I, just, I, just, I had a, uh, like my first job with a spec just shoot me. So there we go. Nope, oh, there you go. I, you know, I just, I guess I. <laughs> Oh, sorry. Oh, no, go ahead, please. Oh, I guess I just don't mind specs because ultimately what you're hiring someone to do is write in someone else's voice. You're hiring them. We'd like them to have a distinct style, but you're hiring them to write for your show. And I sometimes feel like specs are the best way to figure out if somebody's good at doing that because they jump into somebody else's voice and like how effective are they at pulling off those characters. I get torn both ways because I completely agree with that. Like, can they mimic whatever I'm trying to do or what the show is, but it also gives them a lot of crutches. And I find that I can recognize bad writing in an original quicker, for lack of a better word, because they, don't have, they don't have the structure of, now Norm walks into the bar and everyone goes, hey, Norm, because that's in every, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like that's in every episode. Yeah. Um, but it also tells you their taste, I think, too, because do they get the show? Like, like for, yep. for instance, like my Sunny spec, I heard from a number of people that I turned it that in. They were like, well, usually we don't like Sunnies because they're like really outrageous and they're all about like abortion or like something just like insane. And the reality with that show is that they take those big leaps, but they do it in a very like grounded way. And so you can find you can see bad writing shining through oh, on sure. a spec script as well. Um, Ali, spec or original? Did you throw in on that? I'm sorry, I, f I forgot. Original. Okay, you did. Yes. Okay. Well, I think that's it. Hey, guys, thank you so thank much. You. Um, really, thank you. This was really cool. Thank it was you. really fun thank talking you. with you guys. Um, and thank you, everyone, for all the great questions. And uh, we'll see you again sometime. Okay. Uh, bye, everyone.